Hai, selamat sore, selamat datang di Road to Europe on Screen Instagram Live hari ini Kamis 13 April. Hi everyone, welcome to our session of Instagram Live as part of the pre-festival program called Road to Europe on Screen. Uh, but before that, I will have to remind you. Oh, no sound. Okay, let me. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, how 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 does it work? Oh, still no sound. Um. Okay, thanks. Okay. Oh, good with sound now. Thank you so much, uh, Vian48. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I will have to remind you about our short film pitching project um, that is currently going on, that we are receiving submissions until the end of April, which is actually like a week after the 8th holiday next week. So I hope you're also excited about the upcoming long holiday here in Indonesia. And yeah, so why don't we um, invite uh, Theo Sapos from Swedish Film Institute. I think he is here. Um. Feel free to ask. Uh, I hope Theo can answer that. And we already have some questions actually. Hello. Hi Theo. Hi. I'm good. Hi, how are you? How are you? I'm I'm good as well. So, um how's the weather in uh, Stockholm? No, right it's now? good. We finally get rid of the snow. <laughs> Just <laughs> some days ago. Thank. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Actually, I was there uh yeah. at, right after we met in Berlin. I I flew to yeah, to um have some sightseeing. Actually, I passed by your building. But um, my bus passed by your building, but I didn't. Oh, you smoke. see it. It's a it's a beautiful building. It's a it's a brutalist uh, it's so... um, uh, architecture, but it's uh, um, lovemoshed to uh, film the whole building. And I know because I was um, the the bus passed by in the afternoon so the it was around sunset so the sun falls on the uh, residential block yeah. oh, across the, your yeah. building with the white you came in a beautiful day with, with uh... yeah <laughs> it was okay uh, sorry before we start uh, perhaps uh, introduce yourself and your current yeah, so to well, my name audience. is Theo Sapos and I work for the Swedish Film Institute and um uh, we uh, we're an organization that work with the uh, Swedish films in many different aspects, and I work for our international department. So my main focus is to help Swedish film travel outside of Sweden. So we help Swedish filmmaker get into festivals. We help films get uh, a distribution uh, outside of Sweden, and yeah. The main uh, the main work is to get the uh, Swedish film screened to international audience in dif in uh, different venues and different events. Yeah, so not only festivals, but you are also in charge for getting them distributed. Uh, yeah, we uh, outside. So festivals. in general, I would say that we, um, me and my colleagues that work in our international department work with promotion of Swedish films mm -hmm. in general outside of Sweden. Mm -hmm. So of mm -hmm. course festivals is a um, huge part of it because that's a great uh, mm -hmm. um, great launch platform for films and uh, it's a perfect way to get uh, visibility in other countries. But uh, um, mm -hmm. so we are in contact and uh, push for uh, Swedish films to get into festivals. But 
after that, usually uh, the best result uh, for a festival attendance is that a film can be picked up by a local distributor. So the film can, if a Swedish film can be screened in a, a regular cinemas uh, in a wide, uh, to a wider audience. Uh, and if um, mm -hmm. films get picked up by distributors, uh, they, distributors can uh, get funding from us uh, for the release of Swedish films. So we do promotion, of course, tar targeted to festivals, but also targeted to distributors. And we uh, try to find the best way to promote Swedish films and launch Swedish films in different ways. Um, festivals and distribution is, of course, um, the main uh, area, but some, some films can find other ways to uh, get uh, good visibility. So we try to do, do it in... Mm -hmm. All different aspects. I see, but well, uh, I, I hope I got this one right. Uh, you only mentioned that if a Swedish film gets picked up by international distributors, then they can get funding yes. at least from your department. Um, but but what about what about the other fundings? If let's say um, they are. They do not know yet if they their films get picked up by international distributors. Are there any fundings from them to for for them to assist perhaps either the yes. production or the so I only work films? for uh, so I work for the international department that uh, our focus is the international launch, and uh, then I our sort of sister department is the what's called the production uh, support department. So that department uh, mm -hmm. support mainly Swedish productions to get uh, finance so they can mm -hmm. uh, be produced. But we also uh, finance um, mm -hmm. Swedish minority productions. So international productions with Swedish co-producer can be funded by us. Um, and uh, I see. Uh, so when it comes to the production um, funding from the Swedish Film Institute, we fund I would say all kinds of film, but that's always a difficult definition. But we have uh, we have different commissioners that uh, decides on uh, which mm -hmm. films that can be um, get production funding. So we have commissioner commissioners for short films or short formats. We have it for documentary. We have it for uh, fiction uh, or feature films, and for mm -hmm. we have one specialized uh, commissioner for uh, first time filmmakers or debut films and one for youth and children's film. Um, so all, mm -hmm. uh, all different aspects or all different kind of films, I would say. I see. And perhaps for our audiences that are not familiar yet with um, Swedish films, can you give uh, like a very brief um, picture or like how many Swedish feature length films being produced and released um, every year, and perhaps also if if you happen to know the market share of uh, Swedish films uh, yes. in the local uh, um, we, the best. in Sweden, we release we have approximately between forty and fifty local releases in cinema per year, uh, sort of depending, and that's more or less divided fifty fifty between fiction and documentary. So we have. Somewhere around 20 to 25 uh, cine uh, cinema releases of documentary films and 20 to 25 cinema releases of uh, fiction uh, features. Um, then I would add about five, five titles uh, more than that uh, that don't have cinema release but have um, go straight to VOD or something like that. So we will have uh, around 45 to 55 um, long uh, or feature length uh, films uh, produced each year. Yeah. And when it comes to shorts, it's difficult mm -hmm. to say because it also how, how you define, if it's, you should define it uh, like a professional or amateur or, but um, around mm -hmm. 50 to 75 are sort of professionally uh, made per year in Sweden. And uh, this is all. These films are not financed by us. We're we're not capable of financing everything. Um, we finance. We give production support to, I think, around fifteen 
fiction feature length films and about mm -hmm. 15 to 20 documentary titles per year. All right. And, and I asked also about the market share um, in terms of the yeah. box office in local market. How, how, how it's uh, it, uh, on average have you? unfortunately been a sort of a declining number the last years, but we are hoping to um, um, make that uh, trend uh, turn. Um, it has been around uh, between 10 and 15 percent um, uh, market share in Sweden this the last uh, five years. Before that, we had a market share of mm. almost 20. But we're now we're sort of depending on the year between uh, 10 and 15 percent. And uh, I would say uh, has, has... 2020 and 21 are, of course, a really difficult year to uh, uh, to see. And I don't know. I think the numbers were even even more awful that year. But so around I think 12 percent uh, market share. And what kind of films that usually local audience? Uh, for um, if you only go by numbers, it's uh, kind of uh, what works in other European countries, I would say, or mo I think most countries. It's the more broad mainstream drama comedies with famous Swedish actors that works best. I see. But uh, right. this is on only if you uh -huh. count the uh, admissions. But I think if you see the variety, we, yeah. when I say we have about 50 titles per year, I think uh, around half mm -hmm. of those uh, perform quite well, mm -hmm. but also depending on what kind of titles they are, mm -hmm. um, because a uh, festival title or a small art house film, it can perform quite well, uh, but that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean a lot of admissions. It can. Uh, uh, I, I had a good, uh, interesting conversation with a um, uh, friend and colleague uh, that is based uh, from Indonesia, and we talked about these uh, admissions. And I said, in Sweden now, uh, also post pandemic, a um, good uh, number for admission for an art house film can be five to 10,000. We would consider that quite good oh. um, because we are uh, Sweden, okay. uh, we're 10 million uh, inhabitants in Sweden. So, and nowadays, 10,000 for an uh, art house film can be good, but this is the smaller numbers. But uh, good admission in Sweden yeah. for a more, or I would say bigger title is around 200,000. And 200,000 admission. Two and okay. um, I think the best results in the sort of modern time was a man called Uwe. That was uh, also Oscar nominated. Yeah. I think it performed. It had about yes. a million admissions in Sweden, and that was a huge success in Sweden. And I know. And how many have in a, in your uh, country? Have, how many cinemas? Uh, we have about eight hundred screens. I don't know how many cinemas that is wow. because a lot, of course a lot have uh, is multiple screens but around 800 uh, screens, which is quite high compared to other countries, of course. And, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that's also, I can add that we also, uh, the Swedish Film Institute is also supporting cinemas. Uh, we give support to local uh, right. theaters for, uh, um, mm -hmm. so that they can, uh, uh, so we can make sure that we have cinemas in the, smaller communities, smaller towns that don't maybe don't have the capacity of filling seats every day of the week. I see. Well, one million, um, uh, I'm talking about a man called Ove, uh, one million in 800 cinemas. That is astonishing. That, that, that is, uh, yeah. that's huge. I mean, in, uh, if you're talking about the possible number of screens and uh, this, um, what you call that occupancy rate, so yeah, that, that, is, that was a, that uh, was a huge, that was a huge. It has, success. Yeah. That's yeah, 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 an yeah, exception, yeah. right? Now I think a uh, more uh, common good uh, number for a good performing Swedish film is about two hundred thousand admissions. And uh, they that, that's two hundred thousand admissions. And, and <laughs> sorry, uh, 
uh, the 45th the 40 to 50 number of feature length films released in theaters is it like um the common number um or average number before pandemic or uh, is it also we, applicable uh, looking pandemic? at the numbers and we are we have approximately the same uh, amount of titles now as we had before the pandemic uh -huh. I think, of course, during 2020 was almost nothing. Or we had, um, as Sweden was sort of uh, open, uh, or cinemas was open during the pandemic, mm -hmm. but we had a limit. We had during most of the mm -hmm. pandemic, we had a we had a limit of each cinema uh, of uh, eight uh, people in each cinema. That was the maximum number. So <laughs> the few films that premiered didn't perform <laughs> that well, of course because only eight could attend. Um, yeah. So it was a fewer number 2020 and 2021 was not as because, yeah, due to the pandemic. But now, yeah. and 2022 was uh, difficult to uh, measure as well because 2022 was a lot of titles that was supposed to have premiered 2021. And, but when we yeah. look at yeah. the amount of titles that have been produced, it's similar to how it was pre-pandemic. I see. Yeah, I, I think it happens also in most, I mean, in, in many countries in the world that produce films, they still yeah. have like backlogs from 2020, 2020, 2021, I would say, uh, because we are also experiencing having to release all these old films that were supposed to be released back then. Um, just, I, I would like, like to ask you uh, actually something yeah. about triangle of sadness because the reason why is because um before uh, going to this last session i researched uh, swedish film institute and i came across the the um the article in indie wire uh, i think you were uh, being interviewed uh, when you were attending academy awards yes. um something um yeah um yeah yeah, so I just want to uh, I just want to ask you about the journey uh, for the Triangle of Sadness uh, uh, from when it was premiered in Cannes and eventually, I mean, at least many of us did not expect the film to no. be nominated for Best Feature. Or no, it was yeah. uh, it wasn't a, being able to be submitted as be, uh, uh, Best International yeah. Feature submission due to the language eventually picked up director and best uh, screenplay nomination as well. So um, can you yeah, perhaps I would say that, that some uh, of promoting? Sort of, uh, the timeline for uh, Triangle of Sadness, I would say that it's even longer than from the premiere, of course, because um, uh, Ruben Östlund and the production company Platform uh, Production, uh, they have for 15 years been working uh, with the big ambition of uh, achieving bigger and bigger things and uh, when we um, and we have supported them uh, both uh, when it comes to production and when it comes to the international launch of uh, their films and they have done it really well by taking step by step like one um, Ruben Östlund, he premiered with his it was actually his second feature in Unsan Negar, the involuntary I, now I don't remember the year, and um, went from that to Cancer de Real and uh, had after that uh, another film, uh, Force Mayor in Musatnagar, and then went to the competition section yeah. with uh, the Square. That also was that was not Oscar nominated for um, a best international feature. So even when they started the production of Triangle of Sanders, their ambition was to be in the competition in Cannes, of course and achieve yeah. slightly more than uh, the square uh, did. Yeah. And of course, we even uh, on script, uh, we knew that the film, how good it, uh, whatever the result would be, we knew that it wouldn't be uh, eligible for the best international feature category because it was uh, mainly in English. So the production, the producer, the production company, and we, we knew that this is, um, but they will still have the U.S. as a um, key territory. And uh, they worked with an um, um, American company as a co-producer. And 
early uh, were in the, uh, discussion on who's the distributor in um, the US would be. Uh, and they choose uh, the both they choose the publicist, the campaigning team, and the distributor, not just based on Oscar possibilities, but also uh, on best uh, way uh, to distribute a film in the US. But they mm -hmm. choose Neon, uh, that is uh, one of the bigger, uh, bigger art house distributors in uh, the US. And of course, they, they they were the distributor that got nominated and won with Parasites by Bon, uh, bon Jong Hu, and uh, that was a good fit. So they mm -hmm. really know how to how to work with international title in uh, the Oscar um, Oscar race. And of course, they uh, at first the ambition was the sort of side categories, but. Uh, uh, then yeah. when uh, the film first uh, had a North American premiere in uh, Toronto and after that w went mm -hmm. really well in the US, which um, led to uh, that the distributor and the campaigning team thought that this is a poss possibility to get a Best Picture nomination because it works really well. Um, so they uh, targeted that category as well, and it worked well, which was a huge success, of course, for the film. Mm -hmm. How was the film's um, acceptance in Sweden in terms of, especially in terms of the, uh, the uh, box office course, numbers? Uh, Triangle Sanders have performed well in Sweden. Uh, it, it okay. have performed even better in other countries. I think uh, based on inhabitants, I think it goes even better in Denmark than it goes in Sweden. But it has performed, I think, almost uh, around yeah. 200,000 admissions in Sweden, which is really good for... Uh, of course, it's not mm -hmm. a, uh, a difficult art house film, but it's, uh, it's not the classic mainstream uh, uh, title, of course. It's, um, and... Um, of course, the international uh, buzz around the film and uh, the international buzz about, about Ruben Östlund have, of course, helped the film perform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and interestingly, you also choose, I mean, the country chooses Boy From Heaven, which is in Arabic, completely in Arabic, as, uh, as the official submission. I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit perhaps about um, the process of selecting official submission for Oscar. And as much as I love Boy From Heaven, I saw, I saw it, I, I yeah. mentioned to you, I saw it twice in Cannes, uh, back to back two days, because um, I love the film so much. Um, yeah, and I, I also wondered why the film was picked no, as the uh, official submission. Uh, it was, a, it was an obvious selection, I would say. Um, I think it would have been tough uh -huh. if Triangle of Sadness was, in an, it was not in uh, English, uh, so it would be between those two. But uh, with that sort of out of the game, mm -hmm. uh, we, of course, we had a few other strong titles, but we have, um, as you must have, of course, according to the Academy rules, we have a, a committee that uh, chooses Sweden's submission. And uh, I think it's eight people. It's uh, directors, producers, uh, distributors, um, uh, local festivals, etc. There is in this um, committee uh, that is headed by uh, us. And our uh, task with that committee is to choose the. Um, we we always tell the commission members that they shouldn't choose on person uh, personal taste or something. They should choose the film that has the best possibility to reach as long as possible. And when we, yeah. uh, so we, uh, the films that have the best possibility, even of course it needs to be a strong film, but you need to have an international mm -hmm. strong attendance. You have to have, um, you have to have a good international premiere. You uh, should have a US distribu uh, distributor. You should have been uh, screen that uh, the some major American um, festivals, etc. So when we when we list all our uh, yeah our all our fifty titles, we just say these are the films that have premiered in these festivals. These are the ones that have these kind of distributors, and 
then of course, of course we choose the film that has the best possibility. And we had a film that was uh, Boy From Heaven premiered in competition in Cannes, won a best script and performed well in the US and had a good, uh, strong US distributor. So we, I think that the, the choice was obvious. And I would say this is all also goes in line with how we uh, how we see it when we give production support. We we don't yeah. guess, we have no rules about uh, Swedish film that needs to be in Swedish or set in Sweden. In, in our re- general mm-hmm. uh, regulations um, or guidelines, we we need to support films uh, in Swedish, of course, to promote sort of the Swedish yeah. language, but. Uh, not all titles. Um, we uh, mm-hmm. Born from Heaven from us is of course a Swedish title because the main functions uh, are Swedish, uh, like Tarek Sale is a Swedish uh, citizen or is based in Sweden, uh, work, works in Sweden, uh, uh, and other functions. And uh, the most important thing for us is that the production company is Swedish. So, and uh, if you look at it uh, these last years, we have had several uh, Swedish titles that have been sort of had international subjects or international ambitions, like Triangle of Sadness, like Boy From Heaven. We had uh, um, uh, Clara Sola uh, from 2021, and we had, uh, and then we danced from 2019. So we, and I think that, represents Sweden quite well because of course we're we are a small country but we all are also uh, we have a lot of stories set in Sweden in uh, our local productions but we also have where I would consider us as a um, multi-international um, uh, country so of course stories from Sweden includes the full world and Swedish uh, citizens have a uh, uh, background and uh, their stories doesn't can be uh, are more international yeah and would you say that this international mindset in storytelling is one of the strong characteristic of swedish films especially in recent, in recent years, years? Been, or in recent years it's been quite uh, focused in sev- in some titles uh, like sort of an international mm-hmm. outlook but we have a quite long tradition yeah. of uh, both supporting films that are not taking place in Sweden both with our international um, minority support but also films Swedish productions that um, uh, have been sh- shot and uh, take place uh, in other countries the first Uh, the first Swedish mm-hmm. uh, film that was nominated for an Oscar uh, is a film called My Home is Copacabana that is uh, shot and it's a documentary based in um, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and that's from, mm-hmm. I think, the 40s. I don't remember the year. So uh, we have a long tradition of uh, have this international outlook. But uh, I think the right. last 10 years or so, uh, especially Especially when it uh, when it comes to features, it has um, increased these kind of production. And I, in some ways, I would say that uh, Ruben Östlund uh, have influenced that a little bit because he have not just him, but in general, the Swedish film have worked quite well internationally and at festivals and um, uh, for distribution. So other filmmakers have uh, had that as a uh, ambition as well to make films that they make films not just for a Swedish audience. Of course, they make it um, um, so they work for the Swedish audience. But the ambition is that one of the audiences for the film is Swedish, but the other is an in- a possible international audience. And that makes the film more more international. That's true. I think um, after Ovid, then there is a 100-year-old man who, um, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the series of 100-year-old men that got nominated for Oscar, and also um, it was distributed widely in international markets because of the uh, the humor tra- actually translates, and this is actually a tricky thing because uh, 
people say comedy does not travel, but we've seen a lot of uh, Swedish humorous um, comedy films actually do. Absolutely, and that's also something that is interesting uh, because um, we um, we used to say that Swedish humor don't travel, and uh, that uh, and that that works mainly for uh, all films that the uh, the humor uh, humor title comedy yeah. titles uh, are more local yeah. but we had actually a year we had three years in a row where Swedish film won the best comedy film at the European Film Awards but that was also but that was oh, in a way oh, films right. that in Sweden maybe weren't considered as primarily comedy films it was it was the square and uh, um, a uh, pigeon sat on a roof uh, reflecting on his existence by Roy Anderson and, right. uh, and, a, a, man, uh, and uh, a man called Uwe. <laughs> so I don't think none of those films yeah. are classic comedies, but they, of course, have comic elements in them. And uh, it was the same, uh -huh. it was a similar setup with uh, when Force Majeure by, uh, by Roy and, uh, Ruben Östlund was released in Sweden. I would say that we considered it as a um, as a drama, but in a lot of uh, uh, other uh, territories, it was seen as more of a satire because uh, it uh, the behavior of the main characters was in Sweden typical behavior, but in yeah. other other territories <laughs> that behavior was considered as. Uh, excessive or uh, a satire of uh, something that, which made, of course, in those countries, a um, comic effect. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, I, I think up, up until the year 2000, I always associated Swedish films with seriousness, uh, especially having studied Ikmar Bergman, and even at that time, uh, Lucas Modison also mm -hmm. uh, started making prominence, but it was not until I saw oh, Yala Yala. I don't know if you remember. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I I mean I saw it uh, in a Swedish film festival in Singapore, and I was surprised. I did not expect that a Swedish film can be this broad comedy uh, uh, slapstick and mm -hmm. actually made people laugh. I mean, people outside uh, Sweden, of course, and then. Uh, uh, that that film for me personally is the starting point for me to discover other Swedish films that are yeah, not and, typical. And Yala Yala films. was uh, was um, one of its or it uh, when it was released in Sweden um, it was definitely something new uh, and with a new way of filmmaking and um, sort of coming from another kind of not not connected to the Swedish tradition of Ingmar Bergman maybe. And uh, <laughs> no. and of course, I think uh, when you, we look at the full slate of Swedish films, uh, we it is it's really eclectic. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different kind of titles, uh, and I think uh, it's even more eclectic now and than we have had the last years. I think uh, filmmakers in Sweden are not anymore as connected to Ingmar Bergman like they were, maybe were used to yeah um, with this kind of seriousness and um, um, now they're more influenced by international uh, filmmakers and um, other filmmakers I think a new generation of filmmakers now I think Lucas Modison is someone that is more influential than Ingmar Bergman now for new filmmakers because, uh, yeah, and perhaps if you could share some of the current crop of Swedish filmmakers, um, who are the ones that you are excited most about? Oh, this is uh, this is a really difficult question, of course, because we have a lot of interesting directors coming up. But uh, yeah, yeah I w one that I um, it's kind of different categories. One category that I would say that are uh, older, uh, I would say older uh, or established uh, film uh, filmmakers that uh, will release films soon again is Luke, one is Lucas Mulesson that will uh, he is in post production with his latest film, 
Uh, so we will it will be released in okay. Sweden if it's this late this year or beginning of next year, uh, which is said. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. uh, Lucas is. I'm always excited about his new films, and it's similar with uh, Daniel Espinosa, as a Swedish filmmaker that mainly in the last ten years been working in the U.S. making more I would say broad commercial um, action films, and now he's back in Sweden making something that is closer to his heart, art house, art house drama. Mm -hmm. But we have uh, one filmmaker that mm -hmm. I'm always, always excited about is uh, Swedish uh, animator, it's Nicky Lindholm from Bar. Her, uh, she had mainly made shorts that have been at, I would say, all big festivals around the world. She's, and her latest film was a Netflix production that was really exciting. That was called The House. Uh, stop motion animator okay. that is uh, really one of a kind. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned and then dance before. Um, that was, I think, uh, uh, a really impressive, strong film. And uh, Levan Akin, the director, is um, also in post production uh, with his latest film. Mm hmm. Um, Theo, we have a question that um, one of our followers asked in a, in a direct message, uh, Gaston Suhadi. He asked, um, are Swedish films guaranteed freedom in their work by government? Has there been a case where a film by local film filmmakers banned by the authority? Um, That's the question. No. Uh, or, or on top of my head, no. Uh, we have... Um... I think that's one of the strong, um, one of one um, main reason why Swedish film have worked quite well, both internationally and locally, is because uh, artists or filmmakers work quite freely, and we have, um, or we at least we have have had um, sort of um, rule in Sweden that. Uh, politicians shouldn't be involved in uh, decision making about uh, when it comes to art. They should uh, support mm -hmm. organizations like the Swedish Film Institute. So it is sort of a distance between the decision uh, between politicians and um, filmmakers and artists uh, or artists okay. in general. So they can work freely. Um, and uh, of course, we've had some, um, um, uh, I wouldn't say, some scandals and some uh, provocative uh, artists uh, that have been questioned by different people. But uh, I wouldn't say that we have had anything that have been officially banned. Um, mm. So that, yeah, I mean, that is a, I would say a very, it's a very ideal uh, environment or atmosphere, I would say, where, where politicians or people in the government and politics did not interfere with arts. That is, that's very yeah, conducive. Yeah, yes, of course, I think um, environment. I'm a strong believer of that, of course, but uh, as it happens in many European countries, this is something that is not as solid as it's always been. It's uh, um, some politicians and some um, uh, decision makers question this and think that uh, they should be, uh, be able to be more involved in this and be able to uh, steer um, art, uh, artists a bit more or at least how uh, who um, should be financed and uh, who and what kind of projects that can be financed but but we have had, we have had uh, some big scandals about the, uh, some artists, but I think the sort of freedom of freedom of, uh, of expression uh, is always something quite quite strong. And I definitely hope I that see. it can continue uh, because that that is a good recipe to uh, create good art. That's true. And in, in a place, I mean, in the world where 
in many countries, uh, such freedom is considered as, as a privilege or even luxury. It's good that, you know, um, your country keeps doing that. And uh, yeah, and also um, this is a question that have been asked by actually many other festivals here in Indonesia. Um, if they want to work with you, um, because they have uh, most of them have not worked with uh, SFI before. Um, how they do send they me start? an email and we take it from there. <laughs> that's it. Yes, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, I think that's of course uh, one way to do it. But uh, we, as uh, yeah, we work with festivals around the world, uh, but we don't work with all festivals because that's impossible because it's so many. So what we have done in Sweden is that we have also we work closely with um, all Swedish embassies around the world. And we have together with uh, the foreign ministry created what we call, a, uh, you know about this, but we have uh, in each embassy, they have sort of a Swedish selection of films. So we, uh, that is a bit yeah. easier to access than all films. So they, the Swedish embassy uh, in Jakarta uh, have some some yeah. films uh, or Swedish selection uh, that, that uh, is yeah. eas more easily accessible uh, to arrange screenings with. Yeah. That's one way to do it. So I, my advice yeah. would be to contact me uh, or maybe it's difficult here on uh, live uh, with emails, but just go to our website and find my email. That's um, easy. Uh, or contact the embassy in Jakarta. Then the um, Go yeah. to them first. Yeah, uh, that's very helpful. And last question is uh, because we actually uh, exceed our allo allocated time. Um, uh, last question: Top five oh, Swedish films is, of all time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am um, like many film buffs. I'm a big fan of lists, but I think this is really difficult, of course. But uh, you sent it to me before, and I thought it's uh, it's at least fifty. <laughs> but on top of but on top of uh, my head, I think okay. a few that I have uh, that always are coming back to me as uh, one of the stro strongest film is a Swedish love story by Roy Andersson. I think it's one of the, it's not just one of the best Swedish films; it's one of the best films I've seen. Uh, I think uh, mm -hmm. one of my favorite Ingmar Bergman film is The Hour of the Wolf. Uh, I think that's uh, huh? prime oh. Bergman and uh, not, uh, not the yeah. biggest title uh, of him. Uh, in recent years, yeah. I think a uh, bit neglected film uh, that didn't get as much visibility that I, that I, mm, uh, I think it's worth is a film called Hotel by Lisa Langset. Lisa Langsett is a director that made a, a Netflix series, Love and Anarchy, recently that many people have seen. And uh, I think it's, yeah. it's not, not as com has as much comedy as uh, Love and Anarchy, the series, but her film Hotel with uh, Alicia Vikander is, I think, amazing. And um, re um, one of the strongest ones. And... When I do this list, another title that always come back to me is one of my favorite of all time. Is it's, a, it's also a little bit of cheating because it's a British production. It's called a, a, My Settling Shorts. That is from the sixties. That is called a war game. Uh, my Settling is, mm -hmm. I think, one of Sweden's greatest directors and actors uh, of all time. Mm -hmm. That is uh, that made a amazing one of the strongest shorts i ever seen so and that's i think it's available on youtube actually uh so a war game is highly oh, yeah. recommended but in the recent year i think to mm -hmm. see the filmography of ruben Östlund is as a package is uh, <laughs> amazing and to see them uh yeah. one by one as a marathon would be great because you see his development and his, st his style is still there, but uh, that's how uh, he sort of opens up is, uh, would be a sort yeah. of last recommendation. Yeah, 
I I couldn't agree more. I mean, the development from force majeure to um, the square to triangle of sadness is very apparent. Um, and but I have to say, one Swedish well, it's not film; it's series yeah. that scar me oh. for life oh, is yes, scenes from a witch. Um, <laughs> I watch it. Um, I think I've watched it like the entire series. I think about five times now, and. I swear that I will never commit myself in the institution of marriage. Oh, <laughs> thanks to that can, series, uh, or no thanks to uh, that. Uh, and that's uh, of course that's one of the both the film version and the series version is super strong. And I think the, uh, that shows how strong yeah. it is. I think the remake of it that HBO did with Oscar Isaac is also uh, something that you uh, should. I <laughs> like the HBO series. I only watched the two episodes and it's, and it's like, I uh, know, it's not for me. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you so it's much for your time, uh, Theo. Uh, and I hope we Absolutely. get to see you in person in Cannes next see month. You soon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, so that was uh, Theo Tapos from Swedish Film Institute. Tadi kita selesai ngobrol dengan Theo Tapos dari Swedish Film Institute. Jadi kalau teman-teman dari komunitas film atau dari festival film lainnya ingin bekerja sama dengan Swedish Film Institute, if you wanna screen uh, films that have been organized by or rather uh, selected or curated by Swedish Film Institute. Um, you can check their website. is as simple as sfi.se, sfi.se. Jadi silakan teman-teman cari. Nanti bisa juga kontak Theo Sapos di email yang ter ter tercantum di website. You can also email Theo Sapos at his email address that I don't remember <laughs> actually the his exact email address, uh, but you can check that out in the Swedish Film Institute website. Okay, um, right. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for joining the uh, very interesting conversation about Swedish Film Institute and Swedish films in general. Um, we will see each other again next week for another session of Road to Europe on Screen Instagram Live. I'm Novali Azit, Festival Co-Director, signing off. Goodbye.